Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 16. Hear now the word of the Lord as he speaks through the Apostle Paul. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is God's holy and inspired word. Thanks be to him. On Sunday during the announcements, perhaps you remember I made a joke. I said, if the Christmas Eve service is important to you, which isn't a real thing, then the Ascension Day service should be very important to you. It was a joke, but at the same time, it wasn't a joke. Now, the reason why I compare the Christmas Eve service and the Ascension Day service is because neither of them are on the Lord's Day. Christmas Eve generally is not on the Lord's Day. Maybe once out of every seven years, I think that's how it works, with the spinning and the sun and all that kind of stuff. Once every eight years, if you include the leap years. So generally speaking, Christmas Eve is not on a Lord's Day. And Ascension Day is not on a Lord's Day. It's on Ascension Thursday. And so I think they're easy to compare. But what's different about them is that the day before Jesus was born isn't in the Bible. The day before Jesus was born isn't in Scripture, and it's not technically part of the gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ, incarnation, perfect life, atoning death, resurrection, ascension, enthronement, return. But the ascension, as you just heard, is technically, absolutely part of the gospel. And so if Christmas Eve is important to people, which you can tell that it is because we get 50, 60, 70 people come to that service, then Ascension Day should absolutely be important to us because it's directly related to the good news of Jesus Christ for our salvation. One of them is in the Bible. One of them is not. And so was I joking? A little bit, but not really. And as you can see, I'm so glad that we have people here tonight, right? But we sure could do a lot better. And I think the problem is people don't quite understand the importance of the ascension of Christ. The ascension of Christ is absolutely part of the good news. It is absolutely part of the gospel. And if we could wrap our minds around that as a church, not that it's commanded to be here on a Thursday, not that you're obligated to come outside of the Lord's Day, but we'd be full. If you could wrap your mind around how awesome that reading was from Acts chapter 1 and understand how important the ascension is, what Christ has given the church in ascending, the pews would be full. But I am glad that you're here. It's important that we're here to hear about this because what I want us to do is get a higher view 
of the ascension of Christ. A higher view of this literally high doctrine. So what we're going to do tonight is consider what the ascension is for Christ and what the ascension is for the church and for Christians. I want us to have a higher view of it, grow to love it more and more, understand it, comprehend the reality of it and what it does for us. Because it actually does do something for us. And so the purpose of our sermon is to see what the ascension of Christ means for him, for Christ, and what the ascension means for us. Three points. First, the ascension as procession. Procession. Second, the ascension as good news for the church. The ascension as good news for the church. And third, the ascension as good news for the Christian. So let's consider first what the ascension means for Christ. Now remember, Christ was not his surname. When Jesus was young, his friends did not ask their parents, hey, can I go over to the Christ's house for dinner? Nope. It's not their last name. Christ is a title. It's a Greek title equivalent to the Hebrew word Messiah. You ever heard that one before? The Messiah. Messiah means anointed one. It could have been referring to someone who was a prophet, a priest, or a king. But generally, when they said Messiah, they were referring to the king because the king is the one who is anointed and rules over Israel on behalf of Yahweh. And so when they were waiting for the Messiah, they were waiting for the Christ. And the Christ came. His name is Jesus. Jesus is the Christ. In other words, Jesus is the King. The King of kings and Lord of lords, as we heard in our greeting this morning. This morning? Nope. It's nighttime. This evening. So what is Jesus the King of? What is Jesus the King of? Is he the King of a small group of ethnic Jews in the Middle East? See the king of modern day Israel? See the king of modern day America? No. He is the king of kings. He is the king of glory. He is the king of his church. He is the king of the universe. The one who is enthroned above the cherubim. The one who sits high in the heavenly places, seated on the throne. Not in Jerusalem, not in Tel Aviv. Not in Washington, D.C., not in Lansing. He sits on the throne in heaven. Wrap your mind around that. There is an actual place that he is sitting on the throne. Wow. As Hebrews 1.3 puts it, After making purification for sin, Christ sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high with all things under his feet. And so Jesus is the one who left the throne in order to come in the flesh, live a life of perfect obedience on our behalf. Remember, we we actually talked about that earlier this year, leading to Passion Week. We talked about the obedience of Christ, and then we talked about the suffering of Christ, suffering for our sins to make atonement for our sins on the cross. And then we talked about the resurrection of Christ. In fact, I think it's been six, seven weeks we've been talking about that. These are all aspects of the gospel, the whole purpose that he came. He left his throne to do these things, and upon completing the work that God gave him to do, Jesus Christ was taken up into heaven, literally, bodily, He's really there. He ascended into heaven on a cloud. That's not normal. We need to grapple with that. That this is a supernatural act. Just like coming in the flesh, just like his conception, just like his atonement, just like his resurrection, this is supernatural. This is outside of what's normal. If it doesn't sound normal, good. Because it's not. If it doesn't sound natural, good. You're getting it. It's not. It's not supposed to be. 
Our king, when he was taken down off the cross, was dead. Dead. And yet he lives. And he ascended into heaven and now sits on the throne. This is amazing. It's not normal. That's why the disciples were so surprised. That's why their jaws hit the floor. What is happening right now? That's what we would say. He ascended into heaven. His rule is over all. His rule is eternal, and his throne is in heaven. Therefore, the ascension is not just a disappearing act. Let me say it again. I mean, I don't know what I thought about the ascension growing up. I don't know what I thought about where Jesus was. Maybe I didn't think about it. But you have to think about it, right? You have to think about where is Jesus right now? This is not a disappearing act. He, you ever see that uh, TV show Star Trek? They could just kind of... Remember Captain Kirk? He would just kind of evaporate and go somewhere else? That's not what happened. Jesus bodily ascended into heaven. And so his ascension is his procession into the throne room of God. It is his royal procession into the throne room of God where he sat down on the throne. Consider Psalm 24. This was our call to worship. Listen to this. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in God's holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, who does not swear deceitfully. Who shall ascend? The one who never sinned. The one who is perfect. So that doesn't describe you and me, does it? And then you get into this command. I think, I think they're speaking to the angels here. Listen. Lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, O ancient doors. Why? So that the king of glory may come in. Who's this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. So it's, it's a victory procession. He's declaring his victory. Lift up your heads, O gates. Lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of heaven's armies. Often, Psalm 24 is used merely as a triumphal entry hymn. Jesus, you know, allegedly goes into Jerusalem and the gatekeepers of the temple lift up the doors for Jesus and he comes in and they're all worshiping him. That never happened. So I'm not sure how Psalm 24 became a triumphal entry hymn because it's really about his ascension. It's really about his royal procession into the high heavenly places. It is a prophecy. It is a hymn about Jesus' royal procession. The doors that are opened, the gates that are opened, are the gates of heaven. The doors that are open are the doors to the heavenly throne room of God. Wow. That's amazing. That's what we witness in Psalm 24. His procession into heaven. What about Psalm 68? We heard that one. You ascended on high. I wonder who he's talking about. Who's David talking about? You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train. Your procession is seen, O God. The procession of my God, David says. The procession of my God is seen when? As he ascends into heaven. O kingdoms of the earth, sing to God. Sing praises to the Lord, the one who rides in the heavens, in the ancient heavens. Psalm 68 pictures Jesus, the Lord of glory, riding the clouds as a chariot into the throne room of God, the high heavenly sanctuary, where the gates are burst open and Jesus ascends heavenly Mount Zion and sits down on his throne. Wow. That's amazing. That's why he says, this is what King David says as he prophesies this. He says, awesome is God from his sanctuary. Blessed be God. That's what we should say when we're thinking about the ascension of Christ. Awesome. 
We overuse that word, right? Awesome. Everything is awesome, right? No. This is awesome. Psalm 68 is a procession hymn. Psalm 24 is a procession hymn. There's several others from the Old Testament we can look at. In years past, we have. And so we'll move on to Ephesians 4, which is exactly what Paul quotes in Ephesians 4. Or excuse me. In 60, Psalm 60, Paul is quoting Psalm 68 in Ephesians 4. So we've seen that the ascension of Christ is his procession into the throne room. And so in that sense, we can say that the ascension is good news for Jesus. But is it good news for the church? The ascension is good news for Jesus. Is it good news for the church? Paul believes that it is. Because he says this, quoting Psalm 68, Grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In the ascension, Paul tells us, Jesus Christ gave gifts to the church. From on high, Christ pours out gifts to his church, to his body, to his bride. What kind of gifts? Easter eggs? Nativity scenes? What kind of gifts does he give us? He gave, here it is, listen. Think about the gifts that you want from Jesus. Think about them right now. What are the gifts that the church wants from Jesus? Jesus, give me this. Jesus, give me that. Jesus, give me this. Jesus, give me that. What's your top five list? You got it? Is it in your head? It's in your head? Got it? Top five. Jesus gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. Is that what you were expecting? Is that what you wanted from Jesus? He gave the apostles and prophets. In other words, he gave the church the Bible. Because in chapter 2, verse 20, he just said that the apostles and prophets are the foundation of the church. Why? Why? Because through them we now have the Holy Scriptures. Now that gift has ceased. It's expired. So Jesus gave us a gift that expires. And so what else did he give the church? Maybe something that hasn't expired yet? Yes. Here it is. The evangelists. What's that? I'm not going to get into the Greek word, but I'll just say this. It's someone who preaches the gospel. That's what the evangelists are. Someone who preaches the gospel. Without the preaching of the gospel, there's no free offer of salvation in Christ. Without the preaching of the gospel, there's no effectual calling. Without the, free, without the preaching of the gospel, there's no regeneration. Without the preaching of the gospel, there's no faith. Without the preaching of the gospel, there's no sanctification. You see the necessity of the preaching of the gospel. That's why the evangelists, the gospel preachers, are gifts to the church. Then he says, pastors... In Greek, it says shepherds. What is a shepherd? It is a reference to the under shepherds, the ones who shepherd on behalf of the chief shepherd who is in the high heavenly places right now. Consider what the Apostle Peter says. I charge the elders among you, shepherd the flock of God. Why? Because the chief shepherd is in heaven. And that's the command that he's given you. That's a pretty serious charge. So the under shepherds are the elders of the church. These are the gifts that Christ gave. These aren't the gifts that, you know, if we gave a list, we said, here's what I want. I want a new shiny organ. I want better chandeliers, right? I want this. I want that. Gimme, gimme, gimme. And he says, too bad. You're getting a Bible. You're getting a elders, and someone to preach the gospel. Oh, thanks, Jesus. So we need to see these as gifts. And finally, what else does he give the church? What's this last gift? Teachers. Oh, shoot. What do the teachers do? They teach the Bible and they teach theology. It's true. This is what Jesus gave the church. This is what makes the ascension of Christ good news for the church. 
Why though? Why are these the gifts that he decided to give the church? They may not be the gifts that we want, you know, when we first think, what's the gift that I want? We just need to rearrange our thinking a little bit. We need to think the way Jesus thinks. We need to think the way God thinks. Because for him, these are the gifts that he wants us to have. Why? Why? So that we would exchange them for something else? So that we would re-gift them, right? Some of us are good at that. Yeah. Got to re-gift it. I've probably done it before. I don't know. No? Don't do it. Why does he gift the church with the Bible, apostles and prophets, gospel preachers, elders, and teachers? Why does he do that? Because, Paul says, he wants to equip the saints for the work of ministry so that you would know what you're supposed to do with your own individual gifts that Christ has given you. So that you would know what you're supposed to do with the gifts that Christ has given you. So that the whole body of Christ would work together. Unified. Every, every joint, he even says, every joint would work together. He continues, for building up the body of Christ until we attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The body must be edified, built up in the knowledge of Christ. How does that happen? through teachers, through gospel preachers, to be prepared for the Christian life. That's what the, the teachers, the shepherds, the elders, the gospel preachers are supposed to be doing, preparing you for the Christian life so that we wouldn't act or think like children. Paul says that, so that we wouldn't act or think like children who are tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Paul wants us, he says, to speak the truth in love and to grow up in every way into him who is the head of the body. In other words, he wants us to grow in our union with Christ. He wants us to grow in our knowledge of Jesus. He wants us to grow in the Christian faith. He doesn't want us to be divisive. He doesn't want us to be arrogant. He doesn't want us to just be a pragmatic church. Do whatever works. He doesn't want us to be seeker sensitive. He wants us to be a church that grows in the Christian faith. That's why he gave us the gifts that he gave us. He wants us to be a church that knows what we believe, that can see counterfeit doctrine when it's presented to us. He wants to be a church that bears with each other in love. This is what he wants the church to be. He wants us to be, through the gifts that he's given us, more like Christ, our King. All this through the ascension? Indeed. Indeed. He gave gifts to his church, as we confessed. In our larger catechism, he was exalted in his ascension as he in our nature and as our head, triumphing over his enemies, visibly went up into the highest heavens there to receive gifts for men. And therefore, the ascension of Christ is good news for the church. And it's not just good news for the church as a whole, but it's good news for individual Christians. What makes the ascension good news for individual Christians. Well, if we can truly wrap our minds around the fact that Jesus isn't bodily here right now, we need to do that. And if we can do that, that he's not walking with us and talking with us and holding our hands in the garden, that he's not sitting with us in the passenger seat, in, our, in the passenger seat. We're not in London. What am I doing? He's over here. Jesus sits with me when I drive, those long drives to Bay City, oh man, he's right there. Not bodily. No, he's not. If we can grasp that not only was the tomb empty, but with respect to the humanity of our Lord and our King, he's not here. If we can grasp that, then it raises, here it is, it raises our hearts and our minds away from the bad news of the fallen world that we live in, and it raises them to the high heavenly places where Christ is, where he's preparing a place for us, where we're going to eventually be. 
so that we ought not get bogged down by the things of this world. Not that things of this world don't matter at all. They do. But, but not getting bogged down by them. When things aren't going perfect, we raise our affections to Christ. Our catechism said this. He visibly went up to the highest heavens to receive gifts from men and to raise our affections thither. You know that one? Thither? You had to look it up. What it means is it's the old school way of saying toward that place. So our affections are raised towards the high heavenly places where Christ is. And raising our affections thither to the ascended Christ is really important. Why? Why is raising our affections to him? Why is turning our hearts and our minds away from ourselves and looking to Jesus important? I had a bad day. My boss wasn't nice. My coworkers uh, weren't being my friends today. School was difficult. Raise your affections to Christ. My wife isn't submitting the way Christ submits or the church submits to Christ. My husband isn't loving me the way uh, Christ loves the church. My kids are being disrespectful. My parents aren't parenting. You see the list of things that it could be? Raise your affections to Christ. Raise your affections to him. I'm sick. Got really bad news from the doctor. I'm suffering. I'm going through difficult times right now. Things are not easy. Raise your affections to heaven where Christ is. I'm struggling with this sin. I'm struggling with that sin. My spouse is struggling with this sin and that sin. My children are struggling with these sins. Raise your affections to Christ. To the one who has ascended and now sits on the throne. Just because he's not here bodily doesn't mean he's not here for you. He is. Raise your hearts and your minds to Jesus. Remember you're united to Jesus. You're united to him. You're united to the one who came in the flesh. The one who is perfectly righteous. The one who was crucified. The one who's risen. You're united to the whole Christ. And guess where he is? In heaven. You're, you're united to the ascended Christ. Remember that and, and raise your affections to him. Or we could just wallow in our sin and sadness and trials and tribulations and temptations. Give up. Or we could raise our hearts and our minds to Christ. I mean, those are the options, right? The fact that he has ascended and he's there and we're united to him, that's good news. Paul tells us in Colossians 3.1, If then you have been raised with Christ, because of your union with him, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not things here on this earth. And I think we can all say a hearty amen to that. Directing our hearts and our minds to Christ, the one who has ascended into heaven. And so, beloved, as we have considered the ascension tonight, what it is for Christ, his royal procession into the high heavenly places, thus an important aspect of the gospel, what it is for the church. From there, he gave gifts to the church. And what it means for the individual Christian, because we're united to him, we can raise our hearts and our minds to Jesus at all times. And therefore, it's good news for the Christian. Therefore, beloved, let us set our hearts and our minds on Jesus, the one who lived for us, who died for us, who was raised for us, who ascended into heaven for us, and who will return for us. Amen. And thanks be to God for the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ.